Hello, I'm Frank Coletta. Thank you for joining us for a very special presentation. A few weeks ago, as we were preparing reports for the 25th anniversary of the blizzard of 1978, I found something interesting buried deep in our library of dusty old videotapes. It's a Newswatch 10. Yes, in those days we called ourselves Newswatch 10. It's a Newswatch 10 special report, a day-by-day -day chronicle of the blizzard and its unforgettable effect on everyone who lived through it. It was broadcast on March 4th, 1978 and hasn't been seen in its entirety since. As we watch it now, bear in mind it's 25 years old. It's kind of slow-paced compared to the special reports you see on TV today. Parts of it are dark, grainy, blurry, a little discolored. The film jumps every once in a while. But you know, in a way, all of that makes it even more compelling to watch. It's like stepping into a time machine and going back to 1978. Here's your host from 25 years ago, Jack Cavanaugh. The snow came on Monday, February 6th, 1978. And when the skies cleared, the city, the state, lay helpless, entangled in the frozen panic evacuation that never succeeded. It frankly looked as though someone had dropped the neutron bomb. In the frustrating days and hours that would follow, 22 would perish. But most survived. And we watched each other survive on television. For the first time, television was as much a part of the great blizzard of 1978 as snow plows. We have a fabulous archive, 22 hours of videotape, the highlights of which you will see in the next 60 minutes. There had been warning. The forecast had predicted heavy snow up to 18 inches, and we had just been through the worst snowstorm in 10 years. And what was to become the great blizzard of 78? would follow a new storm track that took systems deep into the Gulf of Mexico and then up the Appalachian mountain range to New England. It still continues to be mainly a southern New England snowstorm from Boston on south into Connecticut, New York City, into New Jersey. No snow up north and the storm, Vince, is still not moving and still growing larger. Ironically, it would be Newport which would feel the first flurries. Three days later, it would turn out that Newport and all of Washington County was spared the full brunt of the storm. By 10 in the morning, the snowplows were headed for the Newport Bridge to apply a layer of salt on the slippery roadway. But this was Monday afternoon, and the forecast was still calling for only 18 inches of snow. By Wednesday, one socket would end up with four and a half feet of snow. Within a matter of hours, it was snowing all through the state, Schools, businesses, and industry were in full operation. It wasn't snowing on the way to work, and there seemed to be a collective feeling that the forecaster had been wrong again. By mid-afternoon, in some parts of Rhode Island, it was snowing at a rate of three inches an hour. It was at this point, mid-afternoon on Monday, that the city of Providence and the state of Rhode Island, which depends so heavily on its capital city, was doomed. The five o'clock rush hour came at two in the afternoon, but now the temperature was dropping. The roads were becoming slick. An estimated 20,000 people scurried to outrun the storm. I moved about maybe a quarter of a mile. How far you have to go? Greenville, about 11 miles. You gonna get there? I hope so. Traffic was barely moving. Plows could get through snow, but they were stuck in the traffic jam. They couldn't get through the cars. Time and snow were working together to fashion what later would be called the plug, an enormous frozen snowbound traffic jam which would immobilize the Rhode Island interstate highway system. The lucky heard the dominoes dropping. What do you think of this terrible snowstorm we're having here? I, uh, I'm jammed here for the rest of the duration. You don't look like uh, you're too upset about that. No, not too bad. It, you know, I just try to make the best of it. Rhode Island had been through snow before, but nothing like this. As night set in, the giant storm, still several miles to the south, did the worst possible thing it could do. It stalled. 
tomorrow, the storm center should move from its present position to east of Cape Cod. That means all night long we're going to continue to have this uh, severe drifting and heavy snow problem uh, all the way into tomorrow. And Vince, I've not mentioned a snow accumulation yet. I figure 12 to 18 inches, but again, there will be some six, seven foot drifts here and there, so the accumulation doesn't matter much, I guess. But whatever you had in mind, cancel or postpone and stay calm and keep your sense of humor. By now, we knew it would be a long, snowy night. But six hours into the storm, its true potential was still unknown. To the south, the blizzard was roaring into the New Jersey coast and into Manhattan. And overnight, the electronic eye of the national news media began to focus on the Northeast. Good morning. This is today, Tuesday, February 7th. And there is a weather emergency throughout much of the Northeast and the Atlantic seaboard. The Northeast still paralyzed in a blinding snowstorm. You are looking at Providence, Rhode Island this morning. Hundreds of thousands of motorists throughout the northeastern part of the United States stranded in their cars today. No one is sure just how many will have to be rescued. Jack, we can barely see you. What's the situation? Tom, here in Rhode Island, this blizzard is a killer. There are at least 12 confirmed storm-related deaths, and officials here fear the death toll is going to climb. There are still over 1,000 commuters stranded in their cars on the interstate highways leading into and out of the city of Providence. Most of the people have been in those cars since yesterday afternoon. Rhode Island Governor J. Joseph Garrahy has asked President Carter to declare Rhode Island a federal disaster area. The main concern right now is to keep the local airport open, or actually reopen the local airport, so that any disaster relief that is coming this way can land. There are two feet of snow on the ground. As you can see, it's drifting six to eight feet. And as you can see, it is still snowing. This is Jack Kavanaugh for NBC News in Providence. Boston is still getting the worst of it. Here's Brian Ross. Winds gusted to 75 miles an hour, blowing around a heavy snowfall and reducing visibility to almost nothing. And the blizzard brought another problem, too. Flooding. The winds pushed high tidewaters far into coastal towns. In the Boston suburb of Winthrop, amphibious vehicles had to be used to evacuate at least 50 residents whose homes were flooded in the blizzard. 1,000 National Guardsmen were sent into the area to help in the evacuation. Meantime, in Salem Harbor, an empty oil tanker with 32 men aboard was reported to be taking on water. The Coast Guard says it won't be able to reach the tanker until later today. There are motorists stranded in cars all over Massachusetts highways, and most city streets here are impassable. Dr. Gilman, as you mentioned, is the head of the Long Range Prediction Group here at the National Weather Service. Dr. Gilman, why are we having so much snow on the East Coast this winter? Well, we have something new this winter that we didn't have last year. Last year, the upper air patterns were bringing the cold air very strongly down into the country and really pushing the storm track away from the East Coast and out to sea. This year, we have had something extra. We're getting another branch of the upper air currents coming across the southwest, bringing rain into California, rejuvenating their storms as they come into the Gulf of Mexico and picking up moisture, also getting a little extra energy from the cold and working their way up the Appalachians, either west or east. Today's storm is going to the east. Uh, we have had some very easy winters uh, before last winter, five of them in a row, in fact. And it wasn't until, uh, it wasn't uh, since the 60s that we really had the tough winters. We have a genuine snow emergency reaching all the way from Washington, D.C. to north of Boston this morning. The eastern seaboard of this country is practically paralyzed by heavy snows that struck during the night and are continuing, especially in the New England region. These cars never moved from the highway after the so-called plug was formed Monday night. Many of the cars were still occupied. The majority of drivers had sought shelter. But the only way to understand the magnitude of the situation was to do what photographer George Clark did, to fly into the blizzard in a helicopter. Well, we had heard that, you know, there was a lot of traffic stalled all over the place, and uh, that 95 was blocked, and that 195 East was blocked. But uh, I didn't have any idea as to the extent of this until I got up there. And really, my first impression was that, gee, you know, uh, Governor Gary, he should see this right now as soon as possible. And um, I was hoping that as soon as we get the film processed, after I got back, he would be able to see the situation as it really, really was. And I, 
I was kind of talking to myself up there. I said, gee, you know, I'm not going to get home until at least Sunday because there's no way on this earth that these cars can be moved in just two or three days. It's going to take a fantastic effort to get these cars out of here. I've never seen anything like it. I was a little apprehensive, but I figured if the pilot was willing to go, you know, I'd go along to see what, so what it looked like. There's a heliport over at the South Main Street area near the uh, bridge. And uh, I hiked from here over there uh, through the uh, snow drifts and around, you know, stranded autos. And as I was approaching, the helicopter was also approaching. And uh, he, made, he made several passes around to look the situation over because the snow had drifted so much, the, uh, there was no sign of any helipad. He was trying to figure out where it was. And uh, the snow banks were about six feet higher than ground level. And uh, he had pontoons that he, he came down a couple of times to test, test the snow to see if it was firm enough to hold the helicopter so I could get on it. And uh, I more or less crawled over to the helicopter. And when I got there, he said, keep your head down, because, you know, he was a little uncertain, too, as to what the situation might be. So I crawled on. I, I put the cameras inside first, and I crawled in. As soon as we got up, we went right over. We made a turn and went right over the Providence River Bridge. And, uh, you know, suddenly there was the scene. Uh, we, we gained a little more altitude, about four or 500 feet. And I started filming. I, 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 I decided to keep relatively wide shots so that we could, could see the total picture in the film rather than keeping close-up shots of individual cars. And in the overall scene, it was just an amazing, amazing picture to, to be up there looking down on, uh, on roadways that are normally full of hustle and bustle and now completely dead snowbound, uh, cars, trucks, nose to nose, bumper to bumper, you know, three and four abreast on the roadway. The city was just dead. Nothing completely was. isolated. 95 south, completely blocked. 195 east, completely blocked. North Main Street, completely blocked. Memorial Square in the city, the areas around the post office and in front of the courthouse, completely blocked and isolated, not a living soul down there to be seen anywhere. And the city was just ringed in with the east side hills and the roadways, the, the super highways, just completely isolated the city. There, would, there was no way in or no way out. When you get such a uh, continuous snowfall for three days and it piles up so much, bringing so much helplessness to so many people, it's a really, uh, it's really a disaster. It's the worst you've seen. It's the place. worst I've seen, yeah. I wouldn't want to go through it again, to tell you the truth. The man who piloted the helicopter was Ron Olson of Helicopters Unlimited of Warwick. John Jack uh, says the snow sounds like it might have ice in it. It's a, it's a strange sound. Uh, are we at that point? The, there, could be some, there could be some sleet involved in, in the uh, storm, but I, I would not expect to hail. Yeah. We did have thunder and lightning last, last night, but I, there sleet. could very well be some sleet mixing in. With That's the exactly what it sounds like, John, is sleet. This point. Bill, I think the problem that the uh, state officials are going to have to face now, and the problems are just uh, compounding one on top of another, is food and fuel. There have been so many impromptu shelters set up. There are so many people in so many places. For example, I was told that there are 1,500 people at the Marriott Hotel in downtown Providence. People brought in off the highway. And now those people have to be fed. Uh, some of the major oil companies who uh, supply uh, fuel to the big places, uh, large industrial firms, hospitals, schools, that type of thing, have to get their trucks out to make the oil deliveries. Those are the main concerns. The thing that is uh, unbelievable right now is that we are told by civil defense officials, as uh, you've been told, Bill, is that there are still probably a thousand people in their cars on the highways, and they have been there since uh, by 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon. There's still occasional light snow all the way back through Connecticut into the Hudson River Valley. In fact, Poughkeepsie, New York now has been reporting uh, some moderate snow once again. So I think we're going to have off and on snow most of the day. 
Uh, it may add up to a couple of few more inches, but on top of the uh, 26 to as much as 32 inches that we have around the state now, I guess a couple of more inches, Bill, isn't going to matter very much at this point. The main item, again, will continue to be the drifting. Uh, that's going to be the main uh, thing that will uh, continue to hamper the cleanup operation. And by no means do I expect that situation to be alleviated uh, before, yeah. much before tonight. And getting around is going to be difficult for some time to again, come. Again, I would uh, caution people, again, not still, don't go anywhere today. Stay put. You also ask businesses and schools to close. What about food stores, especially in neighborhood convenience stores? Well, we're hoping that where people can safely do it. Those owners of neighborhood stores and supermarkets, if they would open up so that people could have access to those to those markets and to the foods that are necessary, and we say this with some caution uh, so that people who can safely get to those stores to do it. Otherwise, we think that people in this state ought to stay at home. They ought to prepare for uh, at least a couple of days of isolation. They ought to conserve the food that they have. They ought to conserve fuel, and if they can, they ought to check on their neighbors to see that they're okay. We are certainly in a, a state of, uh, of a dire emergency here in the state of Rhode Island and using every single uh, resource that we have uh, to try to get the state uh, out of this terrible storm. Snowmobiles are the top priority right now. Yes, and uh, Colonel Stone is coordinating that effort throughout the state of Rhode Island. Snowmobiles, of course, can get into isolated areas. They can help stranded motorists, and uh, we're trying to get as many snowmobiles as we can to help. Can you give us some indication from Governor Garrahy what it was like for him trying to get yes. to the State House? Governor uh, Vincent wants you to relay the great story of how uh, you got into the State House today oh and the, uh, the, the birth of the child that you almost participated in. Can you tell us how it was getting in last night? Well, uh, from my house, uh, of course, the National Guard came up to pick me up, and uh, I went from my house to St. Augustine School, where there was about 200 people that were there. Uh, the National Guard finally uh, got to that point to get me out. Uh, we then ran across a state police uh, car who was attempting to get a, uh, a woman who was uh, just about to deliver a child uh, with her husband to the lying-in hospital. Uh, they got stuck in a snowdrift. Uh, we attempted to get them out, and a tow truck came along, uh, thank goodness, because I thought we were all going to be there for the delivery. And we transferred the expecting mother and her husband to the tow truck, who then took them on to lying in hospital. Uh, we then proceeded to get tangled up all the way to the state house. I think it took us over four hours uh, to get from my house or St. Augustine School uh, down to the state house. We got stuck outside Providence College, and some great Providence College students uh, from Guzman Hall on the second floor, 26 of them, came out. Uh, almost lifted the National Guard truck out of a snowplow and got us going again. And uh, then they literally carried me out of the building to the truck. Transportation immobilized. The daylight revealed an estimated 20,000 people stranded right where they were the day before. Here at Union Station, the only things that are really important anymore are the elements of survival. Something to eat. Some place to sleep. Some people here are frantic. They have relatives and friends who are old and sick, and they can't get to them. And some of them are going to be here a long time. The stranded shall never forget this blizzard, especially the out-of-towners. Paul Bass, a chemist, took the train up from New Jersey. I came in last night uh, about 1.30 from New York on the Amtrak train. Did you get much sleep? Very little. On a bench, a few minutes, and over. No, wherever there was room to sit down or to lay down. The telephone, although overloaded, never failed. It was the only way that thousands of missing persons were found again. Rhode Island Hospital itself has been a virtual city within a city. There are some 7,000 people here, staff and wayfarers who have come along down the road. They're here for the duration. They don't know when they're going to get out, but we're told they're being treated very well. Rescue vehicles with their precious cargoes were simply out of commission. Some snowed in, others just sitting there out of gas. Ski-mobiles had to be pressed into use on mercy missions. Inside Rhode Island Hospital, emergency teams stood by, waiting for the dying and injured to arrive, but few made it through the clogged streets. Hospital officials said they were coping with the situation as well as could be expected. Stranded motorists were fed, kept warm, and given a place to sleep. Most of those stranded by the storm had similar stories to tell, and little hope of going anywhere as they began to realize just how paralyzed the state is. I don't think I'll be home for a couple of days at least. The highways are not even being worked down or nothing. 
we're going to stay here for today. We're just not going to go out. There's no place to go. And in fact, we were up on the ninth floor looking out, and there is no traffic moving on 195 and 95. This is the way most policemen are getting around today, on foot. The streets are pretty well plugged up with uh, abandoned vehicles. And we're, right now we're out trying to see if there's anybody in the vehicles that needs medical attention or uh, that has passed away, God forbid. Several people in the city who own snowmobiles have offered their services, delivering food, medication, and doctors to people in need. The police say without them, they couldn't move. Here's what happened when one policeman tried to use his patrol car. The station has been transformed by the storm. It is a temporary morgue, a shelter, and a makeshift hospital staffed by stranded doctors and nurses. How long will it all last? The police say until things are pretty much back to normal. Other than walking or on snowmobiles, there is no way out of the city. We went to be out a company, but they want our food right now, and the coffee wasn't being served for another hour. Are you pregnant? Yes, three months. And walking in the city this afternoon at times was a treacherous chore as bone-chilling winds whipped past stalled vehicles and brutally attacked those challenging the elements. Where are you taking the baby? Bring them back home. Yeah, home. Were we stuck over here? They were, the so we came yeah. down. How far do you have to go? About 15 minutes. Even to the most casual observer, it is obvious that these vehicles can't be moved until the streets are plowed, and the streets can't be plowed until the vehicles are moved. And so while people continue to try to find shelter wherever they can, work crews are trying to clear the streets, but quite frankly, there are so many cars and the snow is so deep that it will be some time, I mean some time, before people are able to leave the capital city of Providence. John Sweeney, Newswatch 10, Downtown Providence. The worst blizzard in Rhode Island's history. Snow is packed all over the ground. There are pathways for people to walk. All of Providence, all of Rhode Island is virtually at a standstill. The snowfall depths on the level, that is not drifts, are well over 40 inches in some places. And uh, Steve Murray up in Manville uh, says he's been measuring 51 inches on the level. The National Weather Service in Warwick has a measurement, Vince, of uh, 26 inches. So I would say that, uh, you know, there's a lot of snow out there. And if we get another inch or so or two tonight, it really probably isn't going to matter that much, except psychologically, as I'd say. It would be great to just have that snow in, and it will do so later tonight. Vince, it's been 35 hours now. Civil Defense, National Guard, Highway Department, State Police, uh, local cities and towns have all been fighting the storm. And nobody is talking about recovery, at least not in the next couple of hours. Senator, the governor says that uh, the crews have been working on Green Airport all day. They're hampered by drifts six to seven to feet tall. But he maintains that uh, if they get some sort of firm timetable from the federal government, then we can indeed be ready for the first flights to land. Well, I think uh, they... Uh I, I, get the, I get the idea that they're a little reluctant to send the troops up in the air before they're sure that there's going to be an airport open to receive them. And uh, I, I, I think if we can, if, if the governor knew that he could have that strip open by, say, 3 o'clock in the morning without fail, even though it was only open for an hour or so, uh, perhaps we could then uh, arrange for them to start. If the federal people would call me directly and let me know that they've got people ready to come into Rhode Island, we'll have the airstrip ready. We have just learned that it is possible to have troops here very, very shortly, and uh, all efforts are going forward on the problem now. But the State House was a world apart from Washington, D.C. The State House sat in the center of what had become a dead city. Where there were once streets, there were now just tracks in the snow. Few realized how imprisoned they were. This poor soul, for example, thought he could shovel out. But he would have to shovel all the way to the city line to get out. And Providence would, in effect, be closed for the rest of the week.
mad rage, nature had turned the tables on us, where only a few hours earlier, we thought we had a degree of control over our lives. We had been brought to our knees, and slowly, one by one, we were dying. More than 20 would be taken by the storm, mostly the sick and the old, cut off from treatment and medication. It was an awesome, frightening, and in a twisted way, beautiful sight. They ran movies all night for the refugees at the outlet. But there were still thousands stranded for another night. Whatever their hopes when they fell asleep, there would be more bad news in the morning. For the first time in two days, it wasn't snowing. The storm had blown away the snow right outside the side door of the state house. Helicopters had test landed during the night, but the governor waited until daylight to fly to meet the army. strangled city had never been so pure. A city of 180,000 was quiet. The silence was broken only by the muffled beat of helicopter blades. For days there would be more traffic in the air over the city than on the ground. It was the first signs of humans regaining control of their lives. The sight of the blazing sun, the virgin snowfall on the ground, and the helicopters in the air lifted spirits for the first time in three days. By Wednesday, we would start to get the first clear picture of our predicament. And the news would not be optimistic. The heaviest part of the snow occurred uh, in an area from west of Boston, around 128 down, into the city of Providence, and also out into the northwestern part of the state. Within this area, three feet or more of snow had fallen, and up in the Woonsocket area, and around Manville and uh, North Cumberland, an area of four feet and above. So really, this is the heaviest snow pocket, although the two-foot level, you can see, is very much into the state of Connecticut and into central Massachusetts, and even the ski areas up north did very, very well, and once you can get to them, there's a lot of snow up there. Governor Garrahy had met with the arriving army troops and taken his first good look at the condition of his state. 
Governor John Sweeney's question is, where are the priorities? Where are the equipment first going to be put to work when it gets here? Well, the first place it's going to be, there's a number of priorities. The first one is interstate at 95 and 195, moving north up into through Pawtucket, uh, East Providence, over through the Washington Bridge, over that way. That's still tangled up. Route 146 and the going up into the one socket area, that's pretty well tangled. There's about 100 uh, tractor-trailer trucks uh, down in uh, uh, the southern part of 95. Hope Valley has got a serious problem with uh, trucks tri tied up down there. The connector road into the airport has got some problems. I think we've identified those areas, really. And then right, of course, in the center of the city of Providence, where 95 comes through, right close by where we are, that's terribly tangled. And uh, those, are the, those are the priority areas right now. Okay, with the uh, professionals in this, the Army uh, engineers who are trained to get rid of this snow, they have obviously been up uh, in helicopters surveying what, and, and as they flew in, surveying what they saw. Did they give you any optimistic uh, time frame as to when it would, how long it would take to get the thing cleared out? Uh, no, they haven't, and I think Colonel Ayers is probably in the air right now. Uh, he's just now uh, assessing it from the air himself. Uh, I think our own assessment, our own Department of Transportation, and uh, General Kiley, our adjutant general, Colonel Stone, I think we feel we need a couple of more days, uh, at least a couple of days, really, to yes. get... The weekend, at least. At least till the weekend. Robbins, please, good morning. You're coming from Boston into Providence, and you're one off the roads are open. All right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you traffic, and they'll be able to tell you. You're welcome. Robbins, please, good morning. 168, Kimball, okay? DOA, all right? Okay, you're going to have to walk in. Well, Any other car coming across the ski mobile, let me know. Providence, the hardest hit, would have to care for its sick and dying by air. And they weren't one-way trips. They also delivered food that way. was so choked with snow and cars that where there was a path open, it was only one car wide. The streets were full of pedestrians trying to walk home, trying to find food, or just trying to get out of the house after two days in the blizzard. The pedestrians would turn out to be a major headache, creating people jams, frustrating emergency medical and food deliveries. And slowly, as the suburbs began to open up, sightseers started filtering into the city, and it would lead to a curfew later. Some food stores were open, but the shelves were getting a little naked. Perishables, milk, eggs, and bread were scarce. But crackers are just as good as bread. <laughs> I'm still looking for a razor and a toothbrush. Do you have any luck with that? I don't think so. The shelters, still holding thousands, were getting their food deliveries late. Last night's stew finally was delivered as this morning's breakfast. And breakfast arrived often at supper time. But this was the third day, and volunteers were getting into a routine. The snowplows did clear a northbound lane of Route 95 today, so snowmobiles and emergency vehicles could get through. Some drivers found their cars looted by vandals. This car, belonging to a jewelry salesman, was ransacked, the valuables taken. Others had their CB radios stolen. I told them that I'd be home when I got there. Uh, it seems rather doubtful today, but I hope to get out of here by tomorrow. But that, too, may be overly optimistic. 2,000 vehicles stranded on the interstate. Getting them out will be a major project. It is mixed up mile after mixed up mile. The evidence appears convincing. Too many motorists got out of work too late on Monday, some as late as 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and could not beat the blizzard. Route 95 has been clogged with traffic before, but it has never looked like this. Around where I live, yesterday was kind of fun. We all came outside and sort of hollered at each other and said things like, I've never seen anything like this, and we watched television. Television told us it was bad, but it's hard to accept as real until you see it with your own eyes. The sight doesn't shock right away. We've seen snow-covered cars before. Until you place this image mentally over the normal picture of highway traffic moving at rush hour. There is no motion here, not by car at least, and there hasn't been since Monday when all the stores closed early at the same time. 
people are walking in what used to be the westbound lane, and still, occasionally, despite repeated urgent requests, a car will go by. Rhode Island and Massachusetts police say they'll start ticketing and then confiscating any cars whose drivers can't explain why they're on the road. Tractor-trailer rigs are bunched up like trains, many of them still occupied by drivers like ship captains who preferred to stay on board. Most of these are familiar with emergencies on the road. The commuters were not. As the sun blazed out today, the full extent of the devastation became clear, but the State House, with our news cam snowbound snugly alongside, provided a beautiful counterpoint. In downtown Providence, there are no roads, only footpaths and snowmobile tracks weaving around the mounds of shrouded cars and buses. In contrast, the traffic lights keep cycling red, yellow, and green, a bizarre vestige of what used to be normal. Officials feel even with the Army's help, it'll be days before those traffic lights are needed again. Since most roads still remain impassable throughout the city, National Guard helicopters have been rushed into service in extreme emergency cases. A command post has been established at police headquarters. In this case, firemen were delivering oxygen to an emergency snowbound patient. Yeah, right, Chief. Well, right now, they can't move at all, but I think that uh, the condition there is critical. You know, they don't think they can get the name from them. Okay, well, in that case, then, just uh, do what you can, and if the chopper arrives, beautiful. Okay. Choppers were also used today to transport patients to hospitals. And in one case, a dialysis machine to a patient. Providence's mayor has issued an order halting most movement in his city. Town, Providence area will be restricted to motor vehicle and pedestrian traffic within an area bounded by Route 95, Sabin Street, South Main Street, Pine Street, and North Main Street. Traffic in this area will be restricted to owners of businesses and other essential personnel who are properly identified as such. The uh, Colonel, uh, Captain Perry, said that uh, the uh, looting that has been prevalent in the Providence area is starting to spread south uh, on the uh, highways. Uh, it's uh, been uh, the looting of, of cars, and he's uh, concerned about that right now. And uh, I think that uh, Governor Garrahy would probably uh, go along with whatever uh, Mayor Cianci thought was best for his city. Okay, Jack, but then at last word, you, as you understand it, we expect or we could be expecting the transports and the troops within the next few hours. Yeah, by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, the figures are that there are uh, like 10 uh, C-141s in the air now that are about to land. They're due in about 12.30. Uh, the snow fighting equipment, by the way, as they're coming off the planes, is being used on the airport connector to help open that up. Uh, some of the C-141s will be used to bring in a tank truck, for example, to fuel those cars. They will be bringing in their own ambulance. They will be uh, their own self-contained unit. And after four days since Governor Garrahy asked the White House to declare this a disaster area, uh, perhaps by uh, 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, maybe later, uh, we could have everybody in the state. The C-5A Galaxy is the largest military transport in the world. It was bringing in the heaviest of the snow fighting equipment. It would be one more day before all 500 men and their equipment were on the ground in Rhode Island. A member of this army team escaped death when he was accidentally run over by a big earth-moving piece of equipment. the day the governor decided to use the emergency broadcast system. The first try was rather embarrassing when he wasn't there when someone pushed the button. Uh, this is Sandy Amato, the State Civil Defense uh, uh, Director. Uh, governor J. Joseph Gary, he has an important emergency message to all citizens in reference to the crisis storm and uh, due to unfortunate circumstance, 
Uh, the governor is still in his aircraft on his way to the State House. We'll be here momentarily, and we hope to get back to you very, very shortly. But the governor finally made it and went on to use it three more times. His messages were later translated in Portuguese and sign language. Some stores are charging more than before for food. If you think you are charged too much, ask for a signed paper. The National Guard has done a wonderful job. 800 soldiers have helped 4,000 people. Thank you all for your patience and for your understanding. For the first time, television was used to provide a picture for an emergency broadcast message. And over the next three days, the formal EBS system was discarded for an impromptu network. WJAR provided the television feed, WEAN provided the radio feed, and the snowbound network was on the air. It was a news conference format. And the political charges between the Republican mayor of Providence and the Democratic governor only came up once. Governor, Mayor Cianci has said that the state hasn't done everything as could. I don't know if you well, want to comment. Well, look, I'm not going to get into political bickering. We've all got problems. I've been fighting uh, since Monday with everybody in the state of Rhode Island, but you haven't heard it over the airwaves. <clears throat> I've been fighting with federal people. I've been fighting in the best way that I can. When I say fight, I, I mean to get the things that I think for Rhode Island's public health and safety. I think we've done a good job. I think I've been quarterback in this thing since Monday. We got a lot of people who now want to be the quarterback on Thursday. We're going to have people who want to be the quarterback on Friday, and we'll have everybody quarterbacking after this is over. We don't need any political bickering. We've got a job to do. Let's cooperate. We've got great cooperation going with people in this state. That's the way it ought to be. We're going to give Providence all the help that we can. Every other community's calling me. Every other mayor wants equipment. Providence does have a serious problem. We recognize that, and we're going to do everything that we can to help them out. The governor had been cool through most of the worst hours of the storm. Political charges from Mayor Cianci and Providence seemed to be the only thing that got him angry, publicly. But well, this was going to be a frustrating day for many people. It was the second day that many had gone to their cars trying to get out. But it would take another day before anything moved. People were starting to run out of food, fuel, and most important, they were running out of patience. About 250 tractor trailers are waiting it out at the Rhode Island, Connecticut border. They are waiting for I-95 to open so they can make deliveries to Providence, Boston, and points north. But Route 95 in the metropolitan area, as you know, is still clogged with cars, trucks, and buses. Bulldozers and front-end loaders began making some headway along Route 95, which is still choked with hundreds of stranded vehicles. Along southbound 95, trucks used one lane for two-way traffic. Some New Yorkers invited a confrontation by trying to push their bus over a makeshift ramp. They said they had to get to Boston. But when troops showed up, they had something else in mind, as did the Providence police. Now get it down. If you start something like this, you're all going to start it. Now that's it. Understand me? Now open this up. And that's it. All day long, the plows and bulldozers made their way around disabled cars and trucks. Some were towed. Truck drivers have been living out of their cabs since Monday night. Jim Bass was heading home to Georgia from Boston, and he has no idea when he'll be going back south. Well, who knows? They say five days, they say later tonight, maybe tomorrow, we don't know. Ready to go now, though. For every stranded motorist, there is a different story. One man summed up his experience. It's something you learn from, something you talk about, something you never forget. By early afternoon, a small measure of progress was being made. Heavy earth-moving equipment had carved a path along Route 95, and a few vehicles were getting out. But these people have been here three days and three nights. They're sick of it. They're running out of patience. In case you're not impressed with the figure of 54 inches, that converts to four and a half feet. That's what covers this entire city of 48,000 inhabitants, and that does not count snowdrifts. 
Some of the main roads in Woonsocket have been cleared of abandoned vehicles and plowed, but most streets remain buried and impassable. Streets are impassable at this time. Plows cannot do the work. What we need is payloaders, dump trucks, because it's not a plowing operation anymore. It's a slow removal operation. Another concern is the supply of heating oil to the city's public housing complexes. Heat has been shut off during daytime hours at two projects because of low supplies. And ironically, the problem lies here, just outside of Providence. Route 146, the main road leading to one socket, is blocked at the Providence end, and supply trucks can't get through. After a two-mile stretch the roads are clear but that is not helping one socket now Following his tour, the governor told Mayor Boulay that Woonsocket is in the best shape of any community he has visited so far in Rhode Island. But even still, the city is waiting for 30 pieces of equipment from Buffalo, New York. And then they say it will be five days before traffic moves in this northern Rhode Island community. After two cancellations, people were allowed to dig out their cars on most of the clogged interstate highways. Route 195 was the first to open up, although hundreds of cars still remain stranded on Route 146 and the northern part of Route 95. And while the interstates were opening up, there were whole sections of the city of Providence that were still impassable. With every passing hour, 195 looked more like an interstate highway. Army troops were assisting many motorists whose cars would not start after four days in the snowdrifts. The big digout was also taking its toll on Army payloaders and jeeps. A number of them broke down. Truck drivers, ready to roll eastward, decided to take matters into their own hands. Using heavy chains, they pulled several vehicles out of the way so they could leave Providence. It was a spirited coalition of Army troops, truck drivers, and volunteers finally seeing some progress. Also today, this snow-covered car caught fire while stranded beneath the Washington Bridge in East Providence. Eyewitnesses guessed a short circuit caused it. So a nearby front-end loader did the logical thing, extinguishing the blaze by burying someone's car in snow, giving another Rhode Islander another reason to remember the great blizzard of 78. The stores that were open were doing a brisk business as neighborhood residents walked from their homes to stock up for the weekend. And for a motorized society, most of the travelers were taking their new mode of transportation, if you'll excuse the pun, in stride. How far have you walked? I walked to Riverside to get my girlfriend. Oh, uh, yeah? You from Riverside? You yeah. walk down here? Yeah. What do you think about all this walking? You usually don't walk like this, do you? No, but I think it's great. Keep the cars off the street. You're a young fellow. You must remember when people walk like this all the time, huh? That, oh, absolutely. I was born 1906. Yeah. How long have you been walking? No. Oh, I guess about an hour. This is where, my second trip. Where do you live? Uh, down, like, towards Johnston. Uh -huh. <sighs> what do you think about that? Oh, I don't know. I hate snow. Hate it. <laughs> so when you get your car out, you're going to still walk? <laughs> as much as possible. Don't lie. <laughs> well, I'm not going to walk to work, that's for sure. Rhode Island was six days into the great blizzard of 78, and half the major highways were still closed. The city of Providence was still snowbound. The city and state had finally gotten together on a mass transit plan that would bus people into the capital city on Monday morning. But first, there was the PC North Carolina game that was allowed to take place as long as no one used a car. Tell me, why, why didn't you stay home and watch this on TV? Well, North Carolina doesn't come north too often. It's a big game, you know? Yeah. And uh, Friars, you know, we were cooped up all week. It's an emergency. It's emergency, right. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Well, I've been coming to the games for so many years now, I wouldn't feel right if I didn't come down today. Being here is different. It's not, not the same as TV. There's a lot going on on the floor that you don't see on TV. You could have stayed at home and watched this game on TV. Why not? Uh-uh, I love PC. I'm, I'm here. I don't care if I have to walk miles for them. <laughs> How far did you walk? From uh, Hoffett Avenue. There's always a few who will take their chances, and the Providence police were there to enforce their no-driving or parking ban. Inside, it was far from a capacity crowd of 12,000, and the estimate was less than half that, but far more fans than was expected. And as the crowd roared, the game was underway, proving the fact that there seems to be no end to true loyalty, as far as PC fans are concerned, that is.
This hour is a montage of what happened during those snowbound days in February. There are many great stories which will never be told because of a simple lack of time. We hope the blizzard was a once in a lifetime experience. It taught us things about ourselves. It was a test. We learned that the automobile, which we depend on for our mobility and our lifestyle, is a deadly friend. Cars were the cause of the trouble. Plows could move snow, but they could not move steel. There was great hardship. Officially, 22 died. There was fear. Some people, stranded in their cars and trucks, refused to go to shelter. There was usury. Some sold dwindling supplies of milk and bread and other precious commodities at very high prices. There was vandalism, burglary, and theft. There was confusion. A suspected looter was shot and killed by Providence police. But by comparison, the ugliness was microspect. The recovery was a tremendous human achievement. We were lucky. There were no major fires, for example. And the system worked. All those anonymous people who work for us, the police, the firefighters, the National Guard, the Civil Defense, routinely saved lives. The medicine, the food, the fuel somehow got through. The power stayed on. The phone worked until we were rescued by the United States Army. We got through it because we could understand. Wherever we were stranded, in shelters or at home, television, for the first time here, became the primary communications link between the government and the people. In the days during and after the blizzard, 92 reports, totaling almost six hours, went out over an invisible microwave beam. In order to understand, we needed to see what was happening to us. Tuesday morning at the height of the storm, we were able to show the country what was happening to us. We saw the people who were making decisions about our lives. On television, we could watch ourselves survive. And there was a great response. People shared their homes with strangers for days. Hundreds of volunteers of all ages just appeared at police stations and hospitals. And the spectacle of the entire Brown University marching band marching around abandoned cars and through snowdrifts in Providence to the roaring reception of thousands stranded in downtown hotels says something about the kind of people we are. We can survive the worst if we all pull together. There are heroes amongst us who will remain anonymous forever. We are resilient. We can survive as long as we can communicate and understand. Thank you and good night. We hope you've enjoyed traveling back in time with us to 1978. Now, by the way, one of those Rhode Islanders stuck in a car on Route 95 that week was a North Smithfield resident who calls himself Jasper James. He wrote a song about the blizzard. And as we conclude our special program, let's listen to a bit of it. I'm Frank Coletta. Thank you for joining us for this special broadcast. See you at the supermarket for bread and milk next blizzard. It was the this is a 78 when the wet sky fell on you. And you took away the things you're going to need, but you learned how to make it do. 
and you made it through. There still will be news, and mixture of news, and good deeds left unsaid.